second performance of Unite and Be Free, the last one was just over a month ago. And uh, it's very nice to be back here doing it again with uh, a sea of new faces. I don't know if um, I don't know if, if anybody's aware of this, but every day since the uh, 16th of August, which was the date of the, the original Peterloo event, the massacre, uh, they they've been tweeting a kind of oh, what happened afterwards. So the day after, you know, the, the tweets come out on this day. So many people were arrested, so many people were, uh, you know, kind of escaped or whatever, and, and so it went on. Anyway, today is Monday, no, today is Friday, the 15th of November, but here we are, Stop Press. This is what happened exactly 200 years ago to the day. Monday, the 15th of November, 1819. This is the last week before Parliament returns after its long summer recess. <laughs> Speculation continues about what the government will do about the public unrest after Peterloo. There are two more protest meetings today in Berkshire and in Lancashire. So here we go. returns two members to the House of Commons, while Manchester, population 150,000, has no representation at all. The textile workers of Manchester and its surrounding parishes have been taught reading and writing in non-conformist Sunday schools. They are better able than many of their class to understand the situation. Some setting aside, though not necessarily forgetting, their Bibles for a while, become avid readers of political pamphlets and radical newspapers. Time now 
to introduce their most famous leader, Samuel Bamford. Silk worker, schoolmaster, radical, Methodist, poet, and writer of songs. His take on a well-known patriotic ditty has already become a popular anthem of social unrest in the years following Napoleon's final defeat in 1815. Princes, the dregs of their dull race, who flow through public scorn, mud from a, midi, a muddy spring. Rulers who neither see nor feel, nor know but leaps like to their fainting country cling till they drop, blind in blood, without a glow. A people starved and stabbed in the untilled fields, an army whom liberticide and prey makes as a two-edged sword to all who wield. Golden and sanguine laws, which tempt and slay. Religion Christless, godless, a book sealed. A senate, time's worst statute unrepealed. Our graves, from which a glorious phantom may burst to illumine our tempestuous day. Other poets and singers are able to describe from ground level the living conditions all too commonly found in times like Manchester. God help the poor. An infant's feeble wail comes from your narrow gateway, and behold, the female crouching there, so deathly pale, huddling her child to screen it from the cold. Her vesture scant, her bonnet crushed and torn. Thin shawled and her baby dear in fold. And so she bides the ruthless gale of morn, which almost to her heart has sent its cold. And now she sudden darts a ravening look, 
as one with new hot bread goes past the nook. And as the tempting load is onward borne, she weeps. God help thee, helpless one, forlorn. God help the poor. Behold yon famished lad, no shoes nor hose, his wounded feet protect. With limping gait and looks so dreamy sad, he wanders onward, stopping to inspect each window, stored with articles of food. He yearns but to enjoy one cheering meal. Oh, to the hungry palate, viands rude would yield a zest for famished only feel. He now devours a crust of mouldy bread. With teeth and hands the precious boon is torn, unmindful of the storm that round his head impetuous sweeps. God help thee, child forlorn. God help the poor. Another I have found. A bold and venerable man is he. His slouched hat with faded crepe is bound. His coat is grey and threadbare too, I see. The rude winds seem to mock his hoary hair. His shirtless bosom to the blast is bare. Anon he turns and casts a wistful eye and with scant napkin wipes the blinding spray and looks around as if he fain would spy friends he had feasted in his better day. Ah, oh, some are dead. And some have long forborne to know the poor, and he is left forlorn. A forlorn weaver, as many man knows, I've knelt to feet and I've worn out me clothes. Me clocks have all broken, and stockings have none, and you'd scarce give me tuppence. For out I've gotten on. Out Billy a bent, he's been telling me long. Might have better times if I'd never told me tongue. Well, I've holding me tongue till I've scarce lost me breath. And I feel in me heart that will soon climb to death. I'm a fallen weaver, as many a man knows. I've got to beat and I've worn out me clothes. Our bill is our eight, but he never was clammed, and he never picked up in his life. He held on for six weeks, thought each day was the last. We tarried and shifted till we were quite fast. We lived upon nettles, and when nettles was good, and Waterloo porridge was best of us food. Our Margaret declares, if her had clothes to put on, I would go up to London and see the great man. And if things didn't alter when there it would been, I swear her would fight for blood up to her reign. I'm a father of whom weaver, as many a man knows. I've now two feet and I've worn out me clothes. Me clocks are all broken, I've no loot to weave on. And I've woven me sin to far end. Neither of the two established political parties have much to offer those outside the world of the wealthy and the high-born. For a poor weaver, the essayist William Hasley, could easily have been describing an aristocratic wing in his description of a modern Tory. A blind idolater of all times and long established customs. A Tory never objects to increasing the power of the crown or abridging the liberties of the people or even calls in question the justice or wisdom of any of the measures of the government. Tory considers all sinecure places and pensions as sacred and inviolable, 
to reduce or abolish which would be unjust and dangerous, accuses those who differ from him on political subjects as being Jacobins, or revolutionists and enemies to their country. A Tory highly values our long pedigree and ancient families and despises low-born persons, the newly created nobility accepted, adores coronets, stars, garters, ribbons, crosses, and titles of all sorts. A Tory deems martial law the best remedy for discontent, considers corporal punishment as necessary, mild, and salutary, sees no hardship in a person's being confined for 30 years in the fleet prison. A Tory is averse to instructing the poor, lest they should be enabled to think and read it. Reads no poetry but birthday odes and verses in celebration of the Battle of Waterloo. A Tory lavishes immense sums on triumphal columns, while the brave men who achieve the victories are left pining in want. And for any politician whose conscience is troubled by doubt, there is always the reassurance offered by that twin power of the established state, the established church. As a Manchester magistrate, the hated Yorkshire parson William Hay wields with all severity authority both spiritual and temporal. <coughs> Come over the hills out of your parson hay. Thy living is goodly, thy mansion is gay. Thy flock will be scattered if longer thou stay. Our shepherd, our vicar, the good parson hay. Oh, fear not, for thou shalt have plenty in thee, far more than a shepherd so humble will need. Thy way shall be ample, two thousand or more, which rents and exaction shall bring to thy store. And if thou shouldst wish for a little increase, thy lambs thou mayst sell, and thy flocks thou mayst fleece. The market is good, and the prices are high, and butchers are ready with money to buy. Thy dwelling house presently stands on a hill. The town lies below it, all quiet and still. With a church at thy elbow for preaching and prayer, and a rich congregation to ponder and stare. And here, like a good loyal priest, shalt thou reign, the cause of thy patron with zeal to maintain. The poor and the hungry shall faint at thy word, as thou damns them to hell in the Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep hath fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. What is freedom? Ye can tell that which slavery is too well, for its very name has grown to an echo of your own. It is to work, and how such pay as just keeps life from day to day in your limbs, as in a cell, for the tyrant's use, to dwell so that ye are for them made. Loom and plough, and sword and spade, with or without your own will, bent 
to their defence and nourishment. It is to see your children weak, with their mothers pine and peak when the winter winds are bleak. They are dying while I speak. It is to hunger for such diets as the rich man in his riot cast to the fat dogs that lie so fitting beneath his eye. Rise like lions after slumber. And sometimes the lions do rise, but for those who march, demonstrate, or even attend political meetings, swift retribution is at hand. The unrecognised spy in the corner of a room makes his report, and then comes the midnight tramp of soldiers' boots outside, the hammering on the door, the threats to break it down. <clears throat> All are preludes to being arraigned before a Manchester jury or Lancashire justice. They came at night and did surround my humble dwelling whilst I slept. And I awoke and heard a sound of feet as if they softly crept. And then a firmer foot there stepped. And then I heard a number more as if a marching pace they kept. I guess there might be a score. And then they knocked at my door. Awake, my love, I softly said. Awake, the enemy is near. Come, kiss me, do not be afraid. A wife of mine should never fear. Arise, dress yourself, my dear. Open the door, the ruffian said. Open her, I will break it down. Break and be damned, I straight replied. I should not have sworn, I own, till I find my clogs and shoes. For all the butchers of your town, that bar of mine I will not loose. So break away, sir, if you choose. And so we huddled on our clothes, and as I fumbled about, the ruffian swore a thousand oaths. Jim can turn some rare ones out. And then, at length, the door I sought and took my trusty bar away. And in it came a mighty rout of thief catchers and soldiers brave. Our British redcoats ever wrote a gallant character to have. You know they did the country save. Sam Bamford comes to know the process quite well and is in and out of jail on a fairly regular basis. <clears throat> one of the more humane prisons in which he does his time is the one just up the road. Morning broke betwixt Garstang and Lancaster. John of Gaunt's tower looked indeed like the stern and lordly keep of an old baron. We passed quickly along the streets of the town. The hussars came trotting, dusty and choking and weary behind us. It was about five o'clock. <coughs> Few people were stirring and the clatter of our cavalcade aroused many from their peaceful slumbers. We dismounted to the feet of the castle steep and walked up, accompanied by our guards, and took our station between the arch and the grim old gates, the boldness and strength of its masonry attracting our admiration. A blow from the ponderous knocker made the place resound, and in a few minutes the wicket gate was opened and we were prisoners in Lancaster Castle. And though he departs his hometown in chains between two grim-faced constables and with a guard of cavalry, it's to the accompaniment of the cheering crowd. Perhaps there's even a band. I wonder if he leaves to the strain of that old favourite, Farewell to Manchester. tossed them human hearts to chew, which from his wide cloak 
he drew. Next came Fraud, and he had on, like Eldon, an ermined gown. His big tears, for he wept well, turned to millstones as they fell. Cloaked with the Bible as with light, and the shadows of the night, like Sidmouth next, hypocrisy on a crocodile rode by. Next came Anarchy. He rode on a white horse, splashed with blood, and he wore a kingly crown, and in his grasp a scepter shone, and on his brow <coughs> this mark I saw. I am God, and King, and Law. <laughs>
we look on our poor children, it grieves our hearts full sore. Their clothing it is worn to rags, while we can get no more. With little in their bellies, they to work must go, whilst yours do dress as manly as monkeys in a show. You tyrants of England, your race may soon be run. You may be brought unto account for what you sorely done. Disabled Bonaparte, he's been spoiled of all, and that we have got reason to pray for his downfall. Now Bonaparte's dead and gone, and it is plainly shown that we've got bigger tyrants and bonies of our own. You tyrants of England, your race may soon be run. You may be brought unto account for what you sorely done. And now we lads, for to conclude, it's time to make an end. Let's see if we can form a plan that these bad times may mend. And rub off the old score. You tyrants of England, your race may soon be run. You may be brought unto account for what you sorely done. You tyrants of England, your race may soon be run. You will be brought unto account for what you sorely done. But to follow an admittedly 21st century way of looking at things, what about the other half of the population? The women of Manchester are, by the standards of the day, a militant lot, and though they take care to behave with decorum, wearing their best clothes, and avoiding that bugbear of the threatened male stridency, they have yet to make their ways of feeling and make their way of making their presence felt. In public meetings, a white-dressed woman who customarily steps forward and presents a cap of liberty to the principal male speaker, together with an address which he will then read. By such actions, the women forfeit, in many eyes, any right to chivalrous or even humane treatment if it comes to a clash with authority. In cartoons by Cruikshank, they are caricatured as neglectful mothers, prostitutes, or knife-wielding Gallic revolutionists. The constables and soldiers on St. Peter's Field will be able to beat and sabre the female demonstrators with a clear conscience. The reality is the Manchester Female Reform Society, led by the formidable Mary Files and many other such organisations in the North West. They do not aspire to the vote themselves, but campaign for universal male suffrage, expecting that it will lead to a shared influence, one family, one vote. In July 1819, the following appears in the Manchester Observer. The Manchester Female Reformers Address 
to the wives, mothers, sisters and daughters of the higher and middling classes of society. Dear sisters of the earth, it is with a spirit of peaceful consideration and due respect that we are induced to address you upon the causes that have compelled us to associate together in aid of our suffering children, our dying parents, and the miserable partners of our woes. Our minds are filled with horror and despair, fearful on each returning morn, lest the light of heaven should present to us the corpse of our famished offspring, which the more kind hand of death had released from the hand of the oppressor. Every succeeding night brings with it new terrors, so that we are sick of life and weary of a world where poverty, wretchedness, tyranny and injustice have so long been permitted to reign amongst men. Dear sisters, we feel justified in stating that when we are mixed with silent dust, you will become the next victims of the borough tyrants who will chase you in your turn to misery and death. We are convinced that the day is near when nothing will be found in our unhappy country but luxury, idleness, dissipation and tyranny on the one hand and abject poverty, slavery, wretchedness, misery and death on the other. It goes on to speak of the late, unjust and destructive war against the liberties of France that closed its dreadful career on the crimson plains of Waterloo. No doubt the soldiers who later claimed to ply their swords on a field nearer to home will remember such sentiments and will ply them with even greater determination and enthusiasm when they recall a meeting held earlier that year in Stockport when they were decisively repulsed with sticks and stones. On this occasion, the bone of contention was an ostentatiously flaunted cap of liberty. Oh, had they taken a cap and fly, what had the dandies taken, and did reformers' courage lie, and could they not regain them, and did And told to be the 
content, but at the same time, a good humoured day out for the workers of Manchester, a sort of picnic with politics. It is Saint Monday, following a time-honoured and widely tolerated custom whereby <coughs> mill workers would sometimes, if they felt it was justified, take an extra day off. The main speaker will be Henry Hunt, Orator Hunt, famous for his eloquence, his incisive political thinking, his advocacy of non-violence, and his trademark white top hat. The day, however, begins with a mild disagreement between him and Samuel Bamford. He overrules Bamford's proposal that a small armed party should guard the colours. But the Middleton contingent assembles nonetheless. Here's Sam himself. 
By 8 o'clock on the morning of the 16th of August, 1819, the whole town might be said to be on the alert. Some to go to the meeting, some to see the procession, the like of which had never before taken place. First were selected twelve of the most comely and decent-looking youths, each with a branch of laurel held presented in his hand as a token of amity and peace. Then the band of music, an excellent one, then the colours, with inscriptions in golden letters, Unity and Strength, Liberty and Fraternity, Parliament's Annual, Suffrage Universal, and betwixt them, on a staff, a handsome cap of crimson velvet, tastefully braided with the word Libertas in front. And among the gathering crowds, Jemima Bamford, Sam's wife. I was determined to go to the meeting and should have followed even if my husband had refused his consent. From what I'd heard the week previous, if the country people went with their caps and liberty, their banners and music, the soldiers would be brought to us. I was uneasy and felt persuaded I'd best go with my husband and be near him. I gave my little girl something to please her, left her with a careful neighbour and joined some other married females at the head of the procession. I was dressed as a countrywoman in my second best attire. My companions were also neatly dressed as the wives of working men. Every time I looked at my husband, and that was often, I felt a foreboding of something evil to befall us that day. When last I caught a glimpse of my wife, she was with some decent married females. I felt not much uneasiness on their account, and so had greater liberty in attending to the business of the meeting. <coughs> At the sound of a bugle, not less than 3,000 men formed a hollow square with probably as many around them. I reminded them that they were going to attend the most important meeting ever held for parliamentary reform. All are reminded of the need for steadiness, seriousness. They will cast shame upon their enemies who have always represented the reformers as a mob-like rally. No one is to break ranks or to offer any provocation by word or deed. And if the peace officers come to arrest them, they should comply. They should avoid drinking after the meeting and leave promptly. Only a few, the old and infirm, are allowed to carry sticks. Many of the marchers have drilled regularly in order to be able to behave with discipline when en masse. But of course, government officials and police spies have interpreted this as a prelude to organised insurrection. May I say with truth, that we presented the most respectable assemblage of working men, humbly but decently attired, not even one without a white Sunday shirt and neckcloth. My address was met with cheers. We opened into column, the music struck up, the silken banners flashed in the sunlight. Some other music was heard. It was the Rochdale party coming to join us. We met and a shout from 10,000 startled the echoes of the woods and dingles. At our head were a hundred or two of women, mostly young wives. Some of our handsomest girls, sweethearts to the lads, danced to the music or sang snatches of popular songs. Hunt and Bamford disagree again, this time about the route to be taken. Bamford sticks to his guns and leads his thousands through the district of Newtown. Here we were welcomed with open arms by the poor Irish weavers who came out in their best drapery and uttered blessings and words of endearment, many of which were not understood by our rural, rural compatriots. Some of them danced, and others stood with clasped hands and tearful eyes, adoring almost that banner whose colour was the emblem of their green highland home. We thanked them by the band striking up St Patrick's Day in the morning,
passed on, leaving those warm-hearted suburbans capering and whooping like mad. I had seen Miss Dull before that time, but Mrs Yates, who got hold of my arm, would keep hurrying forward to get a good place. And when the crowd opened for the, <clears throat> for the Middleton procession, she and I and some others of the women went close to the hustings. My husband got on the stage, but afterwards I saw him leap down and lost sight of him. I began to be unhappy. The crowd seemed to have increased very much. Before we became insufferably pressed, we were surrounded by men who were strangers. We were almost suffocated and to me the heat was quite sickening. I reflected that if there was any more pressure, I must faint. I begged the men to open a way and let me go out, but they would not move. I told them I was sick and they immediately made a way saying, she's sick, she's sick, let her go out. I passed out of the crowd and turning down Windmill Street, saw a door open and stepped within it. I thought I should have a good view of the meeting and perhaps see my husband again. And back on the field, here comes the man with the white hat, watched closely by the magistrate from a neighbouring window. Among them is our old friend Parson William Hay. <coughs> And here is a barrack with soldiers e now, the deed which shall build us for ready to do. They'll rush on the people in martial array, if thou but thy blood dripping cassock display. And meager shall ever be close by thy side, with a brave troop of yeomanry ready to die. For the steed shall be saddled, the sword shall be bare, and there shall be none the defenceless to spare. Then the joys that thou felt upon St. Peter's field, each week or each month some new outrage shall yield, and thine eye which is failing shall brighten again, and pitiless gaze on the wounded and slain. My prince, he shall thank thee and add to thy wealth. Thou shalt preach down sedition and pray for his health. And Sidmouth and Canning and sweet Castle Ray shall write pleasant letters to dear cousin Hay. The sounds of music and reiterated shouts proclaimed the near approach of Mr. Hunt and his party, preceded by a band and several flags. On the driving seat of a barouche sat a neatly dressed female supporting a small flag on which were some emblematical drawings and an inscription. Their approach was hailed by one universal shout from probably 80,000 persons. They threaded the way slowly past us and through the crowd, which Hunt eyed with as much of astonishment as of satisfaction. This spectacle could not be otherwise than solemnly impressive. The precise nature and sequence of events now becomes somewhat uncertain. Hunt's arrival, we know, was greeted by as many as a dozen bands playing See the Conquering Hero Comes. See the conquering hero comes, sound the trumpets, beat the drums, swords prepare the laurel green, songs of triumph to him sing. See. 
trotting, sword in hand, round the corner of a garden wall and to the front of a row of new houses, where they reined up in a line. The soldiers are here, I said. We must go back and see what this means. Oh, someone made reply, they're only come to be ready if there should be any disturbance. But back they go. Already on the spot, pen and pad ready to hand, is John Tyus, a news hound from the Times. The yeomanry cavalry were seen advancing in a rapid trot. Their ranks were in disorder, and they halted to recover and breathe their horses. A panic seemed to strike the persons at the outskirts of the meeting, who immediately began to scamper in every direction. After a moment's pause, they drew their swords and brandished them fiercely in the air, upon which Hunt and Johnson desired the multitude to give three cheers to show the military that they were not to be daunted. This they did. The cavalry were received with a, uh, with a shout of goodwill, as I understood it. The people shouted. Then the soldiers shouted, leaving their swords. Mr. Hunt proceeded. He trusted that they would all stand firm. He had scarcely said these words before the Manchester Yeomanry rode into the mob, which gave way before them. Not a brickbat was thrown at them, not a pistol was fired. All was quiet and orderly. A bugleman went at their head, then an officer. They wheeled round the wagons and surrounded them in such a manner as to prevent all escape. The officer said, brandishing his sword, Sir, I have a warrant against you, and arrest you as my prisoner. Hunt declined to be arrested by the military, but agrees to submit to a civil officer. In this case, Joseph Navin, the chief of police. The yeomanry officer has another go, attempting this time to carry off Johnson, another reformist leader, who likewise will only bow to a civil authority. And Mr. Andrew does the honours. As soon as Hunt and Johnson had jumped from the wagon, a cry was made by the cavalry. Have at their flags! They immediately dashed not only at the wagon, but at the flags which were posted among the crowd, cutting most indiscriminately to the right and to the left. 
is set the people running in all directions, and it was not till this act had been committed that any brickbats were hurled at the military. The Manchester Yeomanry lost all command of temper. Mary Files is on the platform, bearing a small flag. Like all the women, she has her best frock on. She is about to present a cap of liberty and an address to Mr Hunt when the horror is unleashed. She tries to escape, but is held by a white dress snagging on a nail, and a sabre-wielding hero gallops up. Mary is slashed at and badly wounded, but survives and gets away. Another young woman defends herself with an apron full of stones, bringing down at least one of the cavalrymen. Stand fast, I said. They are riding upon us. Stand fast. The meeting was all in a tumult. There were dreadful cries. The soldiers kept riding amongst the people and striking with their swords. A man passed without hat, wiping the blood off the, off the head with his hand. I went unobserved down steps into a cellar passage, hoping to escape from the horrid noise. Upstairs, the people of the house could see the dreadful work through the window and kept bewailing most pitifully. The front door of the passage opened and a number of men entered, bearing the body of a middle-aged woman who had been killed. Their sabres were plied to hew away through naked, held-up hands and defenceless heads. Chopped limbs and wound-gaping skulls were seen with screams prayers and imprecations from the crowd moiled and sabre-doomed who could not escape. On the breaking of the crowd, the yeomanry wheeled, pressing and wounding. Women, white-vested maids and tender youths were indiscriminately sabred or trampled. The cries were piteous and heart-rending, but their appeals were in vain. In ten minutes, the field was an open and almost deserted space. The sun looked down through a sultry and motionless air. The hustings remained with a few broken and hewed flagstaves and a torn and gashed banner or two drooping, whilst over the whole field were strewn caps, bonnets, hats, shawls, shoes, and other parts of male and female dress trampled, torn and bloody. The yeomanry had dismounted, some were wiping their sabres. Several mounds of human beings remained where they had fallen, some groaning, others with staring eyes, gasping for breath, and others would never breathe more. All was silent, save those low sounds <coughs> and the occasional pawing and snorting of steeds. Looking around us, we saw a constable. We appealed for his assistance. He immediately took us into custody. Oh, ho, he said, you then are one of their writers. You must go before the magistrates. He took us to the house where they were sitting, and just as we entered, the constables were conducting Hunt into it, in a manner neither justified by law nor humanity striking him with their staves on the head. A special constable very civilly took my arm and led me over the now deserted field. I durst not look aside lest I should encounter that which I most dreaded to see, the corpse of my husband. One of our people had heard that he was killed. Afterwards I was informed that he was in the infirmary. Another said he was in prison. Then I heard that he'd gone home. And soon after, I had the pleasure of rejoining him at Harper Hay, for which I sincerely return thanks to God.
sometimes with deadly effect, and arrests are many. Held for several days without trial is Elizabeth Gaunt, dragged, though heavily pregnant, out of Hunt's carriage where she was hiding. She will miscarry her child as a result. Mary Files, though after two weeks hiding, will carry on with the campaign. Hunt is taken up for seditious conspiracy. Sam Bank as well. And he is sent off to Lincoln Jail, where he writes many of his political and poems and songs. In one, he sends comfort to his friend Joseph Harrison, himself confined in Chester. When freedom Thank you. 
come and play on St. Peter's Field that day. They set out from Staley Bridge with their instruments, not, strictly speaking, a brass band in those days, having clarinets and oboes and fifes, as well as trumpets and serpents, and, of course, a big drum. The band took a coach to Manchester at a fare of three shillings there and back. And when they passed through Ashton, there were many sneering remarks by the Tories that the band will not come back as merry and light-hearted as it went. Upon arriving, Henry Hunt exclaimed, Gentlemen of Stalybridge, you will require refreshment, and you must now retire to get it. This was well received, and they went to the Union Rooms in Ancoats, where they were duly regaled with something to drink. John Neal rushed in and announced, Damn it, lads, you must be sharp! They're playing the very devil with them on the field! But the band did not relish the prospect of leaving the promised sirloin feast, so stayed put. John Cottrell rushed in and proclaimed, Lads, you won't be off! They're smashing bands and cutting down folks, and if they catch you, they'll smash your instruments and smash you, or put you at New Bailey. A council of war was held. Some wanted an immediate retreat. Others objected upon the grounds that rounds of roast beef were waiting to be attacked. But the former won the day, and the order was given for retreat. Instruments were gathered up, and the band sneaked out of the back door and proceeded through the back streets till they reached the canal. They considered calling at the Georgian Dragon, but a man rushed up, They'll serve you the same as they serve me if they catch you! The crown of his hat had been cut off as clean as could be by the sword of one of the dragoons. The band pursued their retreat with greater speed. When they came to Cow Lane, they saw two dragoons approaching. The drum went over the hedge, followed by the drummer and the rest of the band. It was agreed that the safest plan was to keep to the canal. After six pennies of buttermilk was distributed to keep up their spirits, the retreat proceeded in an orderly fashion. Another six pennies of buttermilk was distributed at Ashton Moss. At Taunton, they each drank a gill of ale and went on through Hurst Brook, Botany, past Hayes Collier in the Coke Ovens, till they arrived at Cockbrook. They reformed into an organised band to enter Stavey Bridge. Without music, in spite of a later tale that they played to see the conquering hero comes, all the band with their instruments, arrived safe and were regarded as patriots who had suffered in defence of popular liberty. <laughs> that very night, they met at the Spread Eagle Inn and regaled themselves with a bowl of punch. And though not a note was played, it is known that in their repertoire at that time was the tune which, with, with which we started this evening, The Downfall of Paris.
downfall of Paris, the downfall of Manchester, but not the downfall of brutal repression, high prices, low wages, child poverty, or political and judicial corruption. There was an immediate crackdown. Radical newspapers were closed and many reformers arrested under hastily enacted laws. The first Parliamentary Reform Act of 1832 did nothing for the working class weavers and their families, although ironically it probably enfranchised many of the middle class yeomen. 106 years were to pass before suffrage universal for men became law in Britain, and another three until the same right was granted for him. How does Shelley conclude his mask of anarchy? And if then the tyrants dare, let them ride among you there, slash and stab and maim and hew, what they like, then let them do. And that slaughter to the nation shall steam up like inspiration, eloquent, oracular, like a volcano heard afar. And these words shall then become like oppression's thunder doom, ringing through each heart and brain, heard again, again, again. Rise like lions after slumber, in unvanquishable number, shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep have fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. Slash and stab, name and hue, what they like, that let them do. And that is certainly good. Father, Sarah, age 50 with four children, the flesh of her right leg loosened from the bone, knocked down and trod on by a cavalry horse. <coughs> Lancaster, Edward, aged 11. Sabre cut on the back of the head, his throat trampled by a horse. Briarly, John, thrown down and trampled by the cavalry. He had some bread and cheese in his hat, which saved him from being cleft with the stroke of a sabre. Files, William, child, rode over by the cavalry and killed. Ferguson, John, shot in the breast by the 88th Regiment. O'Neill, Betty, thrown down and trampled, age 79. Hayes, Mary, six children, knocked down and trampled by a cavalry horse. A foot stripped of the flesh and great toenails. Fits almost daily till 17th December. Prematurely delivered a seven month child, which caused her death. Leaves, John, sabred, killed. Ogden, Joseph, stabbed with a bayonet. When it broke, he was knocked down with the butt end. Isabella Harvey, age 13, thrown down and trampled on, received a blow from the back of the sabre on the left arm, which is far from useless. Walker, James, stabbed in the back, saw a yellow fire into her eyes. Walker, James, beat on the head by the constables. Jackson, Sally, shot in the knee. Well, I enjoy this sort of music. I know one or two of the people who sing in it, and we've followed them round in the district. And uh, I thoroughly want to enjoy a cappella music, so it's just uh, a great joy to me because you so rarely hear it. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I think I went to the perform one of their other performances, but we enjoyed that, so we thought we'd enjoy it as well and haven't been disappointed. I'm extremely glad it's been repeated because I tried to get in on the first uh, event and was unable to do so. Um, yeah, uh, I'm really glad to hear it. It's 
lovely and it's really nice to see this building used um, for something like this. So yeah, it's like, both the event and using the building for an event like this is great. Um, and I've been able to walk here and it's a, yeah, it's just a nice thing to do on a Friday evening. It's good. I originate from uh, the inner city of Manchester. It was never talked about in the educational system in the 1950s and 1960s. You, I only knew about it from my mother, who was um, a die-hard socialist about the Peterloo massacre. Uh, massacre. So it was always in me, and to actually see that performance so intimate, the stand of the, the songs, the way it was done, I just thought it was uh, absolutely magnificent. This is such a moving performance, really moving. It just does bring it home, you know, and you think, how far have we come? Are we going backwards? Yeah. <laughs> Very Persian, and also in a, in a Persian place, isn't it? You know, the, that's something that Gladly Solemn are always very aware of, as far as I'm concerned. They're, they're, where they perform is always pertinent to their performance, if you know what I mean. Thank you very much to uh, Gladly Solemn Sound for yet another fabulous evening's entertainment. Thank you. Try and chance if you're driving, see you again sometime.